Welcome back, troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglies Guitar Show. We've got a fun unboxing and boxing day today. So right in here is a guitar brand that I have never even touched. I've touched one of their bases, but that's only because somebody brought it by and that was a really rare bass guitar and <laughs> I played it like a guitar and people didn't like that video. But I purchased this one uh, from Sweetwater because they happen to have them in stock because apparently there's like a year wait list on these guitars if you're trying to buy one brand new. So that worked out well because this was a, a new guitar day purchase. And if it came from Sweetwater, that means you get candy. What did I get this time? Laffy Taffy, that's nice. Bitto Honey, yeah, that's not too bad. Nice variety. It's strange they use such a large box when the package itself is pretty small. They could have saved themselves some shipping costs if they cut that down. That's what I'll probably do when I ship it. But inside here is a glass guitar. Except for it's not a glass guitar. Why does it say it's glass? I don't know, maybe there is glass on this. Again, I've never actually had one of these in person. I do not know a lot about them, except for they're kind of a historical brand. It's not a Gibson, not a Fender, so that'll please the people that want me to do something different. That's kind of a cool case, like space gray. I was almost scared there wasn't gonna be a case in here with such a small box. Ooh, there it is, Rickenbacker. This case seems smaller than a regular guitar case. Maybe this isn't even a full-sized instrument. I'm not sure. What is this? Did they send me the wrong thing? I'm kind of excited to open this thing now. I'm digging this case. But inside sleeps this Rickenbacker guitar with three toaster pickups. This is a tiny guitar. <laughs> Okay, I was not expecting a tiny guitar here. I thought I was getting like a big old full-size thing. Are all Rickenbackers tiny and they just look big in pictures? So that case seems to shed quite a bit, but this is a USA made Rickenbacker. Oh, and sweet. I was actually talking about this in my uh, Tony Iommi review, how they do the lacquered fretboard. They do that on the Rickenbackers. That's cool. But honestly, I need to go throw this thing on the workbench. I want to know what the scale length is. Yeah, looks about 21 inches. I'm looking forward to reviewing this strange thing. This was not what I was expecting was coming today. Cool. That's why I love my new Guitar Day program. I mean, without that, getting this guy a deal on this guitar, I would have never got to experience one of these things. Cool, and now time for our sponsored message. I don't actually have a sponsor right now because sponsorships have just completely dried up on YouTube lately. I mean, if you're not a YouTuber yourself, you probably don't realize this, but ad rates have dropped considerably. I mean, most channels are down anywhere between 25 to 50% of what we used to make. And I happen to be on the lower end of that spectrum, but I didn't start this channel to make money anyways. That's just kind of, you know, a happy afterthought where I can actually live the life that I could have only dreamed of years ago. But I'm mainly a saver anyway. Anyways, I mean, look, look at my really cool tripod here. I finally broke down and bought one just today. But for today's sponsored message, this was a giveaway done with Matthews Effects and American Musical Supply. And the winner of this, I wrote it down here, was Scott R. We've already contacted him via email. So you'll be getting your set in the mail from American Musical Supply very soon. So thank you for them sponsoring that giveaway. And now we need to move on to some other guitars here. I think we'll start with this small box though. This is just a pickup set. Somebody had contacted me and was like, hey, do you want these pickups? So we kind of uh, worked on a price because it's a pickup set that's vintage that you don't find often. It's not necessarily that people buy them to put them in other things. It's just, if you're trying to restore a guitar, these are really hard to find. I'm not even sure why he took them out himself. So apparently, I believe these came out of his Les Paul Artisan. He just said a three pickup Les Paul, but we were talking previously about an Artisan and these guys have the tar back pickups. And I know personally, I purchased an Artisan and they said it had original pickups and doubt that it didn't. So, so I've been in the position where I've had to, you know, seek these things out before. And since it was like a dispute, we could have paid up to 700 bucks for them. So that's why I picked these things up. This might actually be the bridge. You might be able to get away with that lead length for the middle. This is definitely the neck. You might have to extend some of the leads, but I figured, eh, why not? We'll just pick them up. 
But now we move on to these two. So these started off as kind of consignment pieces. I ended up buying one of them and consigning the other one. I'm not sure which is which. Let's start with this one. He actually got these shipped pretty quickly. He was a little bit confused on how he was gonna get a shipping box at such short notice, but I think he did okay for just being at the Staples Center. The stuff moves around, but you can tell there's enough padding in there, so I don't think we'll have any troubles. But these are uh, guitars that are pretty much in my specialty zone from the Norlin era of Gibson. Well, at least that's what I thought. <laughs> What is inside of here? Yeah. That is an interesting case. And I love doing this magic trick so much last time, I'm gonna do it again. Shazam! So I have never seen a case like this. Hiscox, I've heard of that though, so I've just never had one of these things. Aren't these like one of the most protective cases you can buy? Ooh, I like that. That reminds me of the, uh, Gen 3 chainsaw case latches, but 3,000 times nicer. They're like spring-loaded. Man, can you imagine if they would have used those on those Gen 3s? Then maybe people would like them. Okay, so this is the consignment piece. You'll just see this on my reverb shop after this. This is, I think you said a 71 custom. I mean, it's just gonna be listed as early 70s. Yeah, that's definitely got that thin, thin, thin neck profile and somebody has refinished it in blue. Now, I think I remember seeing this guitar on Reverb like a year or two ago, and it's been sold a few times, and I forget why he's selling it now. I think he was just trying to raise some money because of, you know, everything that's going on. So this is a pretty cool guitar. You can still see the Made in USA stamp, and they blocked off the serial number, so you can actually still see that. Looks like you have that typical line where the fretboard meets the necks. That's nothing to worry about. The only problem with solid colored finishes is you never know what's hiding underneath them. And you can definitely see there was some finish checking here, but I'll have to check with him to see if he knows if there's been a headstock repair or anything. I kind of dig the whole creamed out vibe he's got going on, but I don't like the back plates because that makes it look like a Chipson in my opinion. But I can understand why they're doing it. It kind of gives me an Ace Fraley vibe. And it's been refretted, so I mean, this is something that you can completely customize to your own tastes. But it looks like just about everything has been replaced. But that is definitely an early 70s Les Paul custom because you still have the ABR1 bridge on it. Well, I found the reason this one's been refinished. If you get it in the light just right, you can see the witness lines of a Kaler route that's been filled in. So that solves that mystery. Looks like we got a couple of Seymour Duncans in here. They're both the JBJ versions. But that's transitional neck tenon, so that tells you 70s Gibson but it is the original Gibson ABR-1 bridge. And honestly, even the tailpiece appears to be original yet. Yeah, that's a lightweight tailpiece too. Looks like original thumb bleeders, but replaced knobs. It's been refretted with jumbo frets, that's for sure. Neck specs of 1.64 inches at the nut width. And then by the 12th, we're looking at just under two, 1.98. So, I mean, this is a really thin neck if you like that, 0.79 first. Then it kind of chunks up to 0.99 by the 12th, but that's because you're starting to hit the heel. What's kind of interesting is it almost looks like they moved the tailpiece too, because you can see a little evidence right there where it used to be back further. That's really strange they did that. It must have been some sort of a structural integrity thing. Now, now that I've seen it, I can't unsee it. And you've got a finished chip right there. The truss rod looks to be in good shape. You can see where they filled in where the locking nut used to be. But other than that, you know, the guitar looks pretty good. Oh, and as far as the electronics, it looks like they've swapped everything out in here. Are those push pull pots? Nice. Those look very <laughs> primitive. So that means you probably have some coil splitting abilities on these guys as well. Now, this feels like a poly finish to me. I could be wrong, but the way that it chipped like that makes me think that as well. And it looks like there's a crack within the finish right there, so that could probably peel off. It appears that they kind of coated over the binding a little bit right here too. But as far as the finish job, I mean, it feels professional. I mean, it doesn't feel like a cheap at-home job but I'm sure you could probably do it a little bit better if you really wanted to. If you get it in the light just right, you can actually see it's still that pancake body construction. As far as the weight goes, that's really good for an early 70s Les Paul. Nine pounds, six ounces. So I guess as long as the neck is good, 
Yeah, that's looking good to me. No twists or anything. Just very minimal relief that you could take out if you really wanted to. It appears this finish has at least a little bit of age to it. I think that bridge pickup ring might actually be original, but you know, as you can see, everything else here, uh, not so much. Got some stand rash there. I'm not seeing any evidence of a headstock repair, but again, you never know what you can find under these things if you were to strip it. I really think it was just refinished because somebody wanted a blue Les Paul and they wanted to get rid of the Kaler. Kind of peculiar that they didn't do the burst on the back though. That would have been cool if they would have done the whole burst job. So yeah, I guess if you're interested in a player's grade Les Paul Custom, I mean, either as a project or just to use it as is with a nice Hiscox case, you can check this out on my reverb page. I don't think I'll do a full review and demo. I think that was good enough. You got to see inside of it. Everything's good here. But now let's go see what the other one is that this guy sent me. So we, as I said earlier, this was a, a potential consignment, but I told him this is what I'd be willing to pay because I, I've already done reviews on multiples of these. I probably should redo one of these in the future, but I think this one, strictly business on it. Simply because uh, there's so much I need to do, like that Rickenbacker, there's a bunch of other cool guitars, and more cool guitars coming yet even. But this is from the very early days of the Les Paul Studio. One, two, three, four. Looks like uh, they must have forgot the combo. So they mounted that upside down so nobody would accidentally uh, forget it. Looks like five, zero, two. There you go, I solved it for you. Sometimes that trick works really well, sometimes it doesn't. I'm sure the guy who viciously ripped that apart is very, very upset with me right now that I was able to crack it in like 20 seconds. Darn, that guy got the last laugh. He ruined it so much it doesn't actually stay put anymore. Oh well. Anyways, let's go ahead and see what's inside of our last unboxing of today. That's looking nice. Ooh. So this, a Gibson Les Paul Studio Standard. So if you're not familiar with these guys, essentially what they are is a Les Paul Studio that has binding, not only on the body, but also on the neck. They made the Studio Standards as well as Studio Customs in this era. I believe the Standards were made from like 83 to 87 and the Customs were 83 to 85 if I'm remembering those years correctly. Essentially the only difference between those guys is the amount of binding on the body. The Customs have multiply like, like a Les Paul Custom. But what year is this guy? Oh, that's hard to read. 1983, so that means this is a first year one. That's why it says custom shop edition. They kind of just started as a limited edition thing. This one, I've never actually seen one have the flying V style tuners on them before. But since it's a first year, these are meant to be alder bodies actually. And this one appears to be one, two, three, four four pieces. <laughs> Everything but the kitchen sink on this one. And a one, two, three, four piece top. That's really cool. They actually matched up the back with the top. I'm wondering, does this actually have a maple top? Because that matches up perfectly with the ones on the back. That's kind of interesting. Dang, that's crazy. It is. There's no top to this guitar. It's just a body. So that means they started this with just a huge slab of likely alder and just carved it down to give it the Les Paul shape and the body. But what's really interesting is look how deep that cavity is for the bridge pickup. I have never seen that before. That must just be a characteristic to these really early studio standards. Or maybe there is something to that custom shop edition that this was just a limited run or this is how they were initially meant to be but you can see the ASB stamp in there for antique sunburst finish and we do indeed have our original Tim Shaw PAFs in here and let me tell you these things are worth quite a bit of money because people need them to restore prehistorics so the reason why these studio standards are expensive 
is one, because of these guys, and two, because they look so fancy, right? But they're super lightweight and a little bit thinner than a regular Les Paul. So people will pay almost as much as a regular Les Paul standard of the modern era, a used one anyways, simply because it has all this quirky vintage charm to it. This one appears to be original for the most part. Your truss rod's in great shape. Even your frets are only showing very light wear. But the bridge, as we were talking about earlier, yeah, that's been replaced. That's a Schaller part. It was made in Germany. Not quite sure why you need a roller bridge on a set guitar like this, but I guess you do. And uh, the screw has been replaced. It's a lot longer than the original one. And the strap buttons and the switch tip. So it's all small stuff. All the important stuff is here. But for fun, neck measurements 1.7, 2.04 by the 12th. This is a pretty thin neck, right? Yeah, 0.91 first and 0.97 at the 12th. Yeah, it looks like everything's all original in here and untouched. That's rare. People usually buy these things to strip them out for other stuff. Just because the pickups are worth so much, though, so this is a very nice find. I mean, it's got quite a bit of wear at the same time. I mean, you can see all these nicks and dings. It's not perfect condition, but uh, most people really aren't searching for perfect on these guys. They're just looking for a nice player. So if that's what you're in the search for, I think this would definitely do you well. I'm curious what this neck is made of, though. Is it also alder? That's what I'm talking about, though. Eight pounds, 4.3 ounces. That's a light Les Paul, especially from this era. And under black light, it's definitely looking pretty good. Those knobs look pretty old, but I don't think they're actually the original ones. It's like the back is also glowing the way I'd want to see. You've got some light finish chipping around the neck heel. That's pretty common. As long as it's only in one area, you're safe, though. And the back of the neck is a nice ghostly green color. So we're definitely looking pretty good here. Just a little small finish wear area right here on the neck. And I love the dot inlays on these guys. And only if it's a real mother of pearl, which these guys are, and it has binding. That's the only time I like dot inlays. That was a good buy. It would've been cool to finish up Trey Tuesday season three with a studio like this, but you know, I just bought this outright. So that was some fun guitar buying today. Some unusual things and the things that I love. All right, let's go ahead and pack some stuff up. Now it's time to pack up a couple of these guys. We gotta say goodbye to, I think, the, one of the most expensive guitars I have right now. The Tony Iommi Monkey SG. I knew the right-handed version was gonna sell first, and there were less right-handed versions on the market. I mean, the entire time I was selling this guitar, it was the only one that wasn't being scalped for a higher than new price. So I was able to get out of this one. So if you're interested in that left-handed one, I'm definitely willing to make a deal. I've just recently marked it down on Reverb, you know, way lower than any dealer could ever price one of these things. So if you're a collector looking for one of those, I actually like the aging job better on that left-handed model. But I think what's always gonna make this right-handed one special is the flamed figuring within it. I have yet to see any other ones of these guys actually have that little shininess to it. So even though I didn't really like the aging job on this one as much, I think this is definitely a special example in that aspect. So number 14, to be locked up in a collection, but it is time to ship the $20,000 Monkey SG. Next up, we get to say goodbye to one of the new Epiphone guitars. This thing is such a fantastic value. I had some people asking me, um, what about the Epiphone? I think it's called the Special One. It's got the same wraparound bridge, but it has the master volume, master tone, three-way toggle switch down here. And they were saying those things are like 150 bucks and are fantastic value. So why would you ever get one of these? Honestly, those guitars are night and day. Like this is a full slab body, whereas those guys are a little bit thinner. You've got the independent volume and controls for each pickup. You got your toggle switch in a regular location, set neck versus bolt on neck. Those guys have got the slim 60s neck profile. And I found with Epiphones, you really want the beefier necks because that's what makes the D shape feel more regular in my opinion. But I was initially going to do an unboxing video the day that I made this review, but it just called to me. It said, make my review today. So I went with that instinct and I'm glad I did. And 
the next item to pack up here is actually a pickup. I've had this listed for sale, I think a little over a year, actually. I had purchased a parts lot and this just happened to come in. It's a new old stock Gibson S1 pickup. I think I had two of these and one Marauder pickup. I always thought it'd be fun to throw this into something because they're kind of interesting sounding Bill Lawrence designed pickups here. But it's kind of one of those items. It's not gonna sell fast because not everybody's trying to restore an S1, but eventually somebody will need it. So it's time to move this on to its next home. Now to pack up this guy. This has been like the main feature in two other boxing unboxing episodes, this Les Paul Studio Shred. We had a hard time getting a good one. We ended up settling with this one. This one's actually going off to Canada to a guy who's really excited to get this Les Paul Studio Shred. But the one thing about this guitar is it really does like to attract dust for some reason. It's just kind of how it is. But I tried to clean it up the best I could before I sent it off here. Next up here, this mint green case. I think that shows you what's gonna be inside the Maverick Dorado. So this guitar was really interesting. I'm super glad I got to check it out and it was the first one of the new Parallel Universe series. I'm not quite sure why I was one of the first ones to get one of these things, whereas with that other one that's coming in probably the next unboxing episode, I'm like over a month behind. So <laughs> it's just kind of luck at the draw for that, I guess. But fun story behind this one is somebody actually bought this like within an hour of my video. They paid and everything, but then they backed out the next day I think they had some sort of expense come up so that really hurt the sale of this guitar because everybody thought it was sold because most of my stuff will sell you know within that first couple of hours and then if it gets relisted later on they never see it so flash forward another week somebody bought this thing but I do want to issue a slight correction I don't think this bridge pickup is actually microphonic I because the next two or three demos I've done after this have had that same squeal unfortunately so, so I'm not sure if it has something to do with the pedal I'm using or if it's my amp but if anybody knows can a pedal actually make your pickups microphonic because I actually tested it with my Mesa boogie and I was getting the exact same thing maybe I'm just standing too close I mean my setup I, I'm probably standing back here and my amps would essentially be like where that door is back there that's not like directly on top of it but I've just been recently having these microphonic issues that have kind of been annoying me Our last one to pack up here is also a signature guitar, but this time from the Fender side of things. Now, I believe this video was probably posted a day or two ago, but today is actually the day that I'm editing it, so hopefully it goes out as scheduled. This is the uh, Soul Power Stratocaster, Tom Morello's signature guitar. This thing, you know, I was not that impressed as soon as I unboxed it the first time, but once I put that decal on, that's when it's like, yeah, now it's a signature guitar. It's super prone to fingerprints, but it is a lot of fun if you like Tom Morello. The only downside I see to this guitar is I feel like I have to play Tom Morello type stuff on it. Even though it's a pretty versatile guitar all on its own, I'm glad I got to document it. Thank you, Chocolate Ice, for tuning in to this Boxing Unboxing Day. I hope you enjoyed, and we'll see you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care. And if you made it this far, starting on Thursday, 5-14-20 at 11.59 p.m., if you go to my Teespring shop and type in the code LUCKY with two Ys, you can get 10% off your order.